Well, again, we've got ourselves a very cool topic here on measurement. I love this topic, measurement. It uh, sounds a little strange, so I'll just jump right in. Measurement, assigning numbers to objects or events, okay? Um, it's anything that can be observed can be measured, all right? Um, you can measure anything. You can quantify anything. Um, I, I tend to be very good at measurement, tend to be very good at quantifying things. Okay. Well, it turns out, let, let me kind of put this into a perspective. In psychology, we tend to have um, hypothetical concepts or hypothetical constructs, more, more likely called. Hypothetical constructs are um, love. <laughs> okay. Let's pick a different one. Happy. Happiness. Okay. Happiness is a hypothetical construct. It's imaginary. It's made up. It's fake. It doesn't exist. Can I have one cup of happiness, please? No. One foot of happiness? No. One foot, one cup, one pound? I don't know. I'm running out of, I guess, <laughs> this is science. So I'll go with meters, liters, and grams, right? And you can't get a meter, liter, or gram of happiness because it does not exist. So what happens is that when working with hypothetical constructs, you need to operationally define them. An operational definition is a definition of the construct in terms of the behavioral measures. I'm a behaviorist in terms of the behavioral measures used to measure it. And so I might define happiness as the number of times participant smiles in a 20-minute session. There you go. That's one possible operational definition of happiness. Might be the number of degrees above midline that the cheeks are raised. I don't know, okay? Um, operational definition of happiness. The number of times participant holds the door for other people. I, I, I have no idea, okay? There's tons of ways that you could define happiness, okay? But notice in all three of these different ways, number of smiles, degree of raise, and... Uh, when I say number of doors held, you have quantified, okay? You, using operational definitions, you will, okay, you will make the data, let me see now, publicly observable, quantifiable, repeatable, okay? So all of a sudden, I've got a, 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 a measure or an operational definition of happiness, number of smiles, that is quantifiable, number of, which is publicly observable, I can see them, which is repeatable. Somebody else could take my definition and repeat the study, okay? Very powerful thing. But what we find is that all measurement has two components to it, which is to say truth plus error. Let's say my, again, my operational definition of happiness was number of smiles per hour, whatever. And so what happens is my measure of happiness has two components. One is number of smiles per hour truly measures happiness, but smiles can also be produced for other reasons such as, you know, politeness. Okay? And so that would be measurement error. So we find that any definition that we use of a hypothetical construct will always include truth and error okay so that's a key component because of measurement error we need to be concerned with reliability and validity now i will try to keep reliability and validity somewhat calm but um certain branches of io psychology i actually had my second semester all right my master's degree second semester statistics in my master's degree program was taught by an IO psychologist and OMG she reliability and validity our butts off all right I will not do that to you it was <clears throat> more than I was looking for reliability is essentially the stability of a measure or uh, if I take a measure repeatedly will I get the same results every time okay and so what we find is that if you take a measurement, let's say you're, you know, you measure smiles per hour, and you measure smiles per hour once, twice, three, four, five times, and you get radically different results on all five times, maybe it's because you have a bad operational definition and that there is a lot of 
measurement error in there. Remember the some smiles are social politeness. Maybe a lot of the smiles are not reflective of actual happiness, but instead that measurement error polite. So if you have a lot of measurement error, you will have an unreliable measure. Okay. Test retest reliability is one way to establish how much reliability you have. Um, so what you would do is you administer a test at two different times, okay, time one and time two, and you would look at the relationship between them. Now, I haven't talked about correlations yet. I'll do correlations in uh, the statistics part a little bit. But what you'll do is you'll, you, will do a, you will calculate a correlation between number of smiles at test one, number of smiles at test two. How related are they? How similar are these two results? Okay. Test retest. Another way, uh, what is this? Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, feel free to go for it. I'm describing my own ways, but it, it's essentially saying the same thing. If you have high reliability, then the uh, construct that you have defined, it contains little measurement error. That's what it's trying to say, but it's funky words. Parallel forms reliability is, is sometimes a lot harder to do. And so that is, you might give somebody two different versions of the same test. Um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to do because um, how do you know that two forms of a test are equal to each other? It's kind of it's limited to certain situations. Inter-rater reliability. This is pretty powerful. I mean, let me look at this picture. There you go. Um, the extent to which multiple raters or judges agree on something, okay? And so what we find is, you take a look, look at that. You've got a little thing like maybe these are judges in a diving competition or something like that. And you have very unreliable measure there because three different observers are observing the same dive or whatever they're observing, and they're coming up with quite different scores on this thing. And so inter-rater reliability is not test-retest, but in a single occurrence, do multiple people observe the same thing in it? Okay, so it's a cool idea. Ooh, there we go. Right? We can talk about internal consistency reliability, in which we might um, look at, in, in particular, split half reliability. So if we give somebody a test that has 50 items, maybe what we'll do is we'll look at their score on the first 25 and their score on the second 25 and calculate a correlation between them, and that would be your split half reliability. Okay, yeah, maybe, there you go, first 25, second 25, or odd versus even. Um, in fact, uh, there's a course I believe we are offering called Tests and Measurements here at Wesleyan. And Tests and Measurements would um, really get into this in a lot of detail. I actually took a Tests and Measurements class too, that's right, I forgot. And yes, there was a lot of this stuff in there. Okay. Uh, where am I? okay, now validity. Validity. As a definition, first, I, I guess I, I don't even have the definition of validity, just as validity is um, the degree to which your measure reflects truth, okay, something like that. And so reliability was the degree to which you measure the same thing over and over. Validity is the degree to which you are measuring the truth, okay, because just because you're measuring the same thing over and over and over does not mean you're measuring the truth. Okay, that's a pretty critical idea. So, construct validity is the extent to which a test measures the under, underlying construct it was intended to measure, right? Remember, the construct was happiness, and my test was smiles per hour, something like that, okay? Um, there you go, hypothetical construct, etc. Okay. So, we find that there are two main ways to demonstrate construct validity, content versus criterion. Content validity is the degree to which a test covers, uh, blah, 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 there it is. Uh, not a great measure. It's not quantitative. I don't like non-quantitative measures. Criterion is much more important. The degree to which a test is a good predictor of. So in, in uh, criterion-related validity would be like, um, 
is my measure of smiles per hour allow me to predict other things that I think are related to happiness, such as, um, in fact, happiness often is correlated with different uh, hormones. And so does my measure of smiles per hour predict the hormones that are associated with happiness? Something of that nature. Predictive versus concurrent. So the two different types of criterion related validity are predictive and concurrent. And I just mentioned, well, in fact, I could do it in either way. Um, I could say in predictive validity, I could say, for example, does my measure of smiles per hour predict how much um, happiness hormones, I guess it'd be Hoxycontin or something, but others as well, um, how much happiness hormone you have in a week or something like that. Concurrent validity is would my uh, measure of smiles per hour predict how much of these hormones you have right now? Okay. So one is predicting future, one is predicting current. And again, this is the same type of a an idea, something that has high validity. You see it has essentially parallel lines. Each one of these lines represents um, an individual person. Okay, And so here they were looking at predictive validity, a cognitive ability score, and job performance. So in other words, an IQ test score, and job performance. So I'm looking at the top one. In other words, those that are scoring higher on the cognitive ability score tend to score higher on job performance. And we see it fairly well maps across like this, right? There's a little bit across there, but pretty good. So it's high validity. But you see in the bottom example, those that score high on the cognitive don't necessarily score high on the job, right? And so we find that the top one has high predictive validity, the bottom one has low predictive validity. And I, I guess I'm going to make a flash forward here. Why is this important? Because if you have spent the money, you are, yeah, this is IO psychology, right? So you are the head of the human resources and you've given a job applicant a cognitive ability test, an IQ test, it costs you money, it costs you time. But it doesn't help you predict job performance, then why did you waste that time and money giving that test, right? And so we find that if you do not have predictive validity, you're just wasting your money, right? You're just wasting your time. So it is an important thing, and we will absolutely come back to this in huge detail in, in later chapters. Predictive designs, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, feel free to read that. That sounds like fun to me. Um, and then concurrent, we already described that. And so there's a nice little table to lay it out for you. And so what the heck is this one? Oh, I see. It's just a summary of the different types of reliability and validity. So the key, as I said, reliability is the ability of a test to repeatedly measure the same thing over and over. Construct and validity in, in, in this particular course, construct validity in particular, is is your measure truly measuring what you think it should measure? Is it a good reflection of what it's supposed to?